The average U.S. diet exceeds protein requirements and provides about 1.2 daily grams of proteins per kilogram of body weight. When we refer to high-protein diets, however, we do not refer to the slightly higher protein intake that all of us more or less have. We refer to way higher protein intakes, over 2 grams of proteins per kilo per day, often 3 grams and even 4 grams of daily proteins per kilo of body weight. There are mainly two segments of the population that may have such high protein intakes. One is weight loss dieters. Many popular weight loss diets are high protein diets. These diets make you lose weight fast, although most of the initial weight loss is not fat, but water to flush out the extra nitrogen. The other segment is athletes, and especially bodybuilders. We already know that you do need a little bit more protein to build new muscle, but the protein you get from an average diet is in general already more than enough. There is a physiological limit to how much muscle you can build in a day, and to cover that, 10 to 20 extra grams of daily proteins will be enough even for the most motivated of the bodybuilders. The DRI say that no additional dietary protein is suggested for healthy adults undertaking resistance or endurance exercise. So their need for protein is the same as every other healthy adult. Other institutions agree that athletes need more protein. Some say 0.9 grams per kilo, some 1.2 grams per kilo, some 1.5 grams per kilo. But anything above that is wasted. So when we get all that extra protein, what do we really do with it? We know that our body cannot store excess protein for later use, so one of these two things will happen. If we need energy, then we will use the extra protein for energy production. And this is the case of athletes on high-protein diets. They get all these extra proteins, they need a tiny little bit more for muscle growth, and the rest they just end up using for energy. The other possibility if we do not need extra energy because we are sedentary, then we will have nothing else to do with these proteins other than converting them to fat and store them in our adipose tissue. This is what often happens to athletes when for one reason or another they stop exercising. But they keep eating the same way they were eating before. And so all the excess proteins that before they were burning now just get converted to fat which will show up in their bellies within a couple of months. Many of them will blame the lack of exercise, but really the problem is not just that they stopped exercising, but that they kept eating as if they were still exercising. And now all those extra proteins, they are not burning anymore. Our next question is, is there any particular concern with high-protein diets? We already know that going on high-protein diets is mostly useless, but is it harmful? One concern that is very often brought up is that excess protein overburdens the liver and kidneys because of the work they have to do to catabolize them. Remember, the liver has to remove the toxic ammonia, turn it to urea, and send it to the kidney for prompt clearance. Early nutrition scientists concluded from this biochemical fact that somehow your liver and kidney get tired or even damaged from doing this extra work over the long term. But the truth of the matter is, they don't. We have studies done with athletes eating insanely high amounts of proteins for extended periods of time, and their liver and kidneys don't really care. Our liver and kidneys are perfectly equipped to deal with protein catabolism without any problem, as long as they're healthy. If they are not, so you have liver disease or kidney disease, then protein intake needs to be more controlled. Another possible concern is simply that you may be getting excess calories. Like we said, if we get extra proteins and we do not need them for anything else, we will just turn them to fat and accumulate them into our adipose tissue. But this is not a concern for athletes, since they are burning their proteins for energy. And while they get more calories from proteins, they generally get less from fats and carbohydrates. It may be a problem of excess animal products. For most people, going on a high-protein diet generally means just eating more meat and animal products, which is bad not for the proteins, but for everything else. You're likely getting a lot of saturated fat, have a diet that's low in fiber, your gut microbiota will change in a way that's less favorable, increasing the risk for colon cancer, and so on. Again, this is not generally a problem for athletes, since they mostly use isolated proteins, the typical 
protein shake. But for normal people, going on a high protein diet, they'll just eat a lot more animal food. Dehydration is another possible concern. Remember that high proteins induces water loss, so if you're not drinking enough, that may become a problem. It is, however, a minor concern, since generally we drink enough water. The most significant concern associated with high-protein diets is that they increase urinary excretion of calcium. When you go on a high-protein diet, you start flushing out a lot of calcium. And we're not exactly sure why this happens, but very likely it is because to catabolize amino acids, and especially the sulfur-containing ones, methionine and cysteine, we generate acids that need to be buffered to maintain the right blood pH. The kidneys normally do that, but if we have a lot, then the kidneys alone cannot do it anymore. And so we use calcium to buffer these acids, make salts, and flush them out. The first consequence of this is an increased risk for kidney stones formation, although this only happens in genetically predisposed individuals. The other concern is bone mineral loss and risk of osteoporosis and bone fractures. Indeed, if we are not getting enough of this calcium from diet, we will need to steal it from our bones to buffer the protein-generated acids. And if this happens over and over again, we will deplete our bones of their precious calcium. Once again, for athletes, this is a minor concern because resistance training is so good at increasing bone strength that it more than compensates any possible issue with calcium. So in conclusion, exceeding protein needs is unnecessary because we already get enough from our normal diet. But for athletes, it is not a major concern. They'll just use the excess protein for energy. However, for sedentary individuals, long-term excess protein can be detrimental. It's a lot of excess calories, it's a lot of animal products, and it will increase calcium excretion and therefore risk of kidney stones and loss of bone mineral density. On top of their function as part of proteins, individual amino acids may directly intervene in some metabolic pathways on their own, or a starting material to build other important non-protein regulatory molecules. For example, the amino acid tryptophan is precursor of the vitamin niacin and of the neurotransmitter serotonin, and for this reason it has been marketed as an individual supplement for pain, depression, or insomnia. The amino acid tyrosine is the precursor of neurotransmitters dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, as well as the skin pigment melanin and the thyroid hormone thyroxine, together with iodine. Glutamate is used to build the neurotransmitter gamma-aminobutyrate by decarboxylation. Cysteine is used to make taurine, essential for bile acids metabolism, muscle functioning, and many more. Lysine and methionine are used to make carnitine to transport fatty acids across mitochondrial membranes. The branched-chain amino acids leucine, isoleucine, and valine are so named because they have a branched carbon skeleton. These are the three amino acids that are preferentially used by our muscle as energy source when glycogen stores are depleted. For this reason, they are often sold as supplements and marketed as amino acids for sport. But you likely not need them because you get enough from food. They are also abundant in milk whey. Arginine, glycine, and methionine are needed to build creatine, a quick backup source of energy in our cells. Arginine is also a precursor of nitric oxide, which has a vasorelaxant effect on our blood vessels, thus lowering blood pressure and improving blood flow. For this reason, it is often marketed as a sports supplement, as well as glutamine, which appears to boost immune function, but also preserve lean body mass and promote muscle growth. On top of the 20 amino acids used for protein synthesis, there are a few other that our body needs to regulate specific pathways such as ornithine and citrulline in the urea cycle. Although some amino acids are sold individually as supplements, research is often limited and we need to be careful not to confuse single supplements with the therapeutic value of whole foods. Single amino acid supplements are almost always dangerous if used improperly. 
The biggest problem with single amino acids, aside from the fact that they are very expensive and their taste is horrible, is that they may alter absorptive mechanisms in the intestine. Amino acids often share the same carriers for absorption, as if they all had to go through the same door to be absorbed. If you have large excess of just one or a few, chances are that the other will not be absorbed efficiently. They will be lost among the excess of one single amino acid, and so absorption of all the remaining essential amino acids may be impaired.